uh, welcome you for the uh, for those that have not ever been to our program uh, or to our facility. This is a, a rather new one for us. We used to be up at Union Square, and we just moved here almost a year ago. Um, we have a 10-year existence in New York City for those that don't know that Cornell was actually here beyond our friends at the Tech Campus that are being uh, actively developing the Roosevelt Island site. But on behalf of Dean Ken Kleinman, I want to welcome all of you. We're very excited to be able to uh, be the facility host for this fabulous uh, six-part series, The Deep Dive. And uh, we really look forward to being able to host you here. I want to just give you a little bit of a sense. We have the entire floor. Uh, my students are at the far end, and they're on break. So if you come back next week, you'll see a lot more students from Cornell that will be here. Uh, a few of them are down at the end of the hall. Uh, we have restrooms right over here, right outside this part of the hallway. Uh, you're free to walk around, and for those that have not found their way to the great window uh, at the end of the gallery, uh, you are in the Standard Oil Building, the former Standard Oil Building, the headquarters of J.D. Rockefeller. Uh, this was where he built his oil empire, and I think it's somewhat unique uh, and appropriate that we would be talking about uh, waterfront issues and certainly climate change in the weeks to come uh, here at the base of the carbon empire, which of course is no longer. So um, there are some fabulous pieces of the Rockefeller legacy that are still in this building. The vault is still downstairs, of course. And uh, we've lost a few pieces in the lobby. Uh, you might notice that there's a large niche that would have had his bust, but I think it's at the Rockefeller family uh, compound up in Westchester, so that's missing. Uh, but there's a great uh, legacy here, but um, we're very, very happy to have you. And without further delay, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Roland Lewis. Thank you for being here. And, uh, I trust all of you know him because he doesn't need an introduction, otherwise I would give it. Uh, all right. Well, maybe I, I think I know a few, but actually, Bobby, bringing up the first law, uh, there's like physics laws and other laws that we get, traffic laws. The law of any event that the Waterfront Alliance does is that you must, you must meet one person you don't know already. Actually, for this one, I'm going to say two people you don't know already. Tell them what your interest is in the Waterfront, if you have one or if you'd like to get one. And uh, that's so you can't leave if you haven't done that. Bob, I want to thank you. I want to thank Cornell. Um, this is a, uh, I was the first, I've heard about your facility because uh, some of my staff Jose has been here, uh, and it's, it's actually far more than I imagine. I would be so appreciated, and not Mazel Tov, but many, many happy years here uh, at your new facility. Um, what about Alliance? Uh, let me tell you just two things about, a couple things about us, uh, and then a little bit about the event, and also I want to, um, we're going to you know, give a good applause for our sponsors and, uh, and we'll hear from them too. But, Warfare Alliance, for those of you who don't know, I think many of you do, is a uh, movement, an organization of organizations. Over 900 businesses and civic organizations are comprised who we are, a big umbrella group. We do all sorts of things to help connect people to the harbor, basically. That's what we do. We're trying to make that waterfront right behind you uh, more useful for, for jobs, for transportation, for recreation, for education, for art for all sorts of wonderful things that connect the, uh, those to uh, uh, those of us who are uplanders to the water that surrounds us. I'm particularly excited about this, uh, this panel as a uh, son of artists and as a father of artists. Mm -hmm. um, I am I'm, uh, just thrilled to hear what your thoughts are about why we do art on the waterfront and, and, how, and how we can do more art on the waterfront and connect people to that waterfront through, our, through the art that you guys are, are creating. Um, the Warfare Alliance does a lot of things. Check us out on the website, please. Uh, we uh, uh, advocate for all sorts of things and building things. Uh, we have one thing I will mention is our conference. Uh, this, this is the first time we're doing this sort of uh, rolling uh, speaker series, uh, but it's leading up to uh, the, the biggest thing that we do uh, as far as a convening event, uh, other than our big city board day, which is a big public event in July, uh, July 16th this year. Uh, May 12th, <coughs> mark it down, is our waterfront conference. It's a, we are the conference on a boat. We go, we go float, we float uh, uh, and we talk about great uh, issues that affect our waterfront like this one. So if you, li if you like this, you're going to love the conference, please come to a market. It's a, it's a, great, it's a great bargain, especially those in, in the uh, Pacific world. If you're, if you, if you're, for for uh, pittance, you get two meals, cocktail party, great content, and a boat ride. <laughs> uh, it's unbelievable. Uh, Gotta raise up prices. 
Um, so uh, anyway, um, uh, 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 please do check us out on the website and please do get involved with our work if you're not involved already. Uh, I want to give a special kudo to my, my colleague here, uh, uh, Jose Sogard. Put your hand with Jose. Yeah. Yeah, he'll be uh, uh, instructing you a little later about how to use your computer machines that's in your pocket. Mine's a phone also. Um, and uh, <laughs> to uh, do things to vote and whatnot. It's, it's part of the, part of the uh, festivities today. But Jose put this series together and has done a lot. Does amazing work for us. Please meet him too uh, before you leave. Um, we are, this, this event is sponsored by two great companies, two progressive companies, Arcadis and AKRF. And we have two representatives. Why don't you both come up here and say hello and a couple of words of welcome. Uh, uh, Edgar Westwell from Bob White uh, from uh, Arcadis and AKRF uh, respectively. And then I'll uh, hand it over to our facilitator. So come on, gentlemen, say a couple of words. Thank you, everyone, for the kind introduction. And uh, yeah, a pleasure to, uh, to say a few words of, uh, of welcome. For those of you who are not familiar with uh, Arcadis, we are uh, a quite large engineering firm, big presence all over the U.S., and I have the privilege to, uh, to travel quite a bit to waterfronts all over the U.S., not just New York City, but also places like you know, the Bay Area, New Orleans, uh, Norfolk, Boston. And you know what you see is that there is a lot of activity coming back in New York, in New York City. Um, I would say, a, you know, what, what New York has in common with other places is that we tend to talk to engineers, you know, planners, architects, uh, the academia, and that's why I believe you know, the arts can, can bridge a gap. Uh, I also have the privilege to be married to an artist, my wife Sarah Cameron Sunde uh, is currently working on a global performance, 36.5, a durational performance with the sea, standing in the water during a, a tidal uh, cycle, check it out on the web. Uh, so I look forward to this dialogue, thank you. So I'm Bob White with AKRF. We're a much smaller and local firm than Arcadis, but um, I've been fortunate enough to be working in New York City, focused on the waterfront for about 30 years. Wow. As well, young as I look to you all, I'm sure. <laughs> but um, it's been really exciting to see how the waterfront's changed, and I'm fortunate enough to have worked on some really fabulous waterfront projects, both on the development side and on the park side, so it's been a great experience professionally for me, and I've been, my company's been a sponsor of uh, Waterfront Alliance for 20 years. I remember those little events that they used to happen out at Governor's Island, and they've really grown, so congratulations to the Waterfront Alliance and all the things that they've been doing and done over the past several decades. So that's it for me. Thank you all for coming. Now on to the meat of the matter. Uh, let's get going. Uh, starting us off, Nancy Novacek is going to uh, not only facilitate but present, and then we'll hear from the other panelists. And I look forward very much to the dialogue and, and the presentation and your participation too through your computer machines. <laughs> Can you hear me if I if this is in my forehead? It's <laughs> good. It's good. Okay, great. So you can just watch, feel like a unicorn, a sad unicorn. Um, thanks, Roland. Thanks, Jose. Thanks, the, thanks to the sponsors and everyone at the Waterfront Alliance, and thanks to all of you for coming. Uh, it's really exciting to get to have this conversation tonight with these incredible panelists. I'm going to introduce them a little bit to you. You may know who they are, but you're going to know a little bit more right now. So, um, Jean Barberis, to my far uh, right, is a maker, an artist, and a curator, but he rarely makes a distinguished distinction between the various aspects of his practice. Uh, his work is almost exclusively revolves around collective initiatives. Um, he's more engaged as an artist in the curatorial process and the ability to foster collaborations while encouraging the productions of ambitious new works. His interests are vast and varied and include urban exploration, shoemaking, boat building, and engaging in exchanges and economies outside the confines of capitalism. Kate Keda is the Director of Grants and Services at the LMCC, where she has been so since 2005. Uh, she's responsible for planning and programming LMCC's Manhattan Arts Grant and Professional Development Programs, as well as the Arts East River Waterfront Initiative, which is made up of several partnership projects, including Paths to Pier 42 and iLab East River. 
and we're I'm so excited to have her here tonight. Um, lastly, Mary Mattingly. Uh, Mary creates sculptural ecosystems in urban spaces. She's currently working on a floating food forest in New York called Swale, and recently completed a two-part sculpture called Pull for the International Havana Biennial with Museo Nacional, I'm not a Spanish speaker, Nacional de Belles Arts de la Habana and the Bronx Museum of Arts. Um, her work has been exhibited all over the place. And in 2009, Mary founded the Water Pod Project, which is a huge public space and self-sufficient <coughs> habitat uh, based on a barge that hosted over 200,000 visitors in New York City. Um, also in 2014, she did an artist residency on the water called Wetland in Philadelphia. And she also recently installed a partially underwater bridge in Des Moines. So it's a pretty incredible group of people we have together tonight. And I'm really excited to get to do this because this talk um, is the kind of outcome of a large public project I've been working on for the past several years, which I'll tell you about in a moment. Um, and it really comes out of the kind of learning experiences in that project. But it's also a conversation that's inspired by the current state of the city. One in which more and more artists are looking to the waterfront and the waterways as inspiration or material or site for their work. And one in which there's renewed interest in the waterfront and waterways by residents, envir environmentalists, as well as commerce and development. Uh, so with, without further ado, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my work and then pass on the mic. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you a little bit about a project called Citizen Bridge. But when I wasn't sitting by the table, I was reaching out through every channel possible. Email, internet, ferry rides, phone calls, anyone wearing a Turner jacket on Governor's Island. Um, and Mary was really quite helpful. She put me, she was the first person who kind of answered my cries for help and helped me get in touch with the Coast Guard, um, who was actually quite kind. And they kind of set the initial constraint of this project, which would be up, that it could be up for about 24 hours. That was, that was their offering back. So you'll see how that begins to play out. Um, but in this process of learning, I found my way to Rob Buchanan at the Village Boathouse, and I went rowing with him. And you can see the distressed look on my face, because it's the first time I'd ever been rowing in the harbor. Um, soon after Rob Buchanan, I met Captain John Doswell, who became my fairy godfather. He introduced me to the Waterfront Alliance. He introduced, he introduced me to the Working Harbor Front Committee. He introduced me to the Harbor Operations Steering Committee. And from there, I met the Harbor School, Brooklyn Boat Works, the other boathouses, folks at Riverkeeper, the Billy Oyster Project. He literally opened up the waterways to me. And so over the course of learning, I began to develop ideas for what this bridge might look like. This is the very first rendering. It's a, rend it's a sketch that basically that lays out the idea, the first design for this bridge, which would be made of the kind of transitional materiality of the city, construction barriers, construction mesh, construction scaffolding, and wooden planks. And using these materials allowed us to be very, to create a modular design, something that was also participatory and could be quickly installed and deinstalled to acknowledge that 24-hour window. And so my process of learning became a process of learning by doing, and I started building over the course of several years many, many prototypes. Upper left is the first prototype on Governor's Island. Um, I learned there that to actually make a bridge, you need two points, not just one. Um, following that, supported by residency through recess and pioneer works, a second, a third at the Marie Wall Sharp Foundation, and then a fourth actually at City Water Day, City Water Day in 2014. Um, but building them wasn't enough. I had to test them. And so, Learning by doing takes on a whole other kind of meaning when you're talking about working on the water. I can see some of you smiling. Yeah, it's incredibly comedic. Trying to kind of understand how these materials and structures actually behave in the water if you don't have a background in the water. So I've been slowly building a background with, of the, with the water as much as I have been building a kind of, uh, I guess, a, a, a world of interest around the project, which has included writers and teachers and artists and architects and engineers and my neighbors and even students at the Webb Institute on Long Island Sound and students at the Stevens Institute in Hoboken 
who, all of whom were trying to kind of help figure out some engineering around the project. I've also turned to some of my younger fellow citizens who last, oh, I'm sorry, this slide is so bad, sorry, um, who last Earth Day in City of Water Day started entering their own designs for the bridge. Um, and what I found, and the reason I keep working on this project, is everyone who meets the project gets really quite inspired that someone would ask the question, can I build a bridge by hand in the New York City Harbor? Um, it expands people's idea of, what, of, of actually what might be possible in this city. Um, and the last uh, and most recent prototype, built in partnership with engineers at Thornton Tomasetti and Gloucester Marine out in Seattle, Jonathan Marble, as well as a team of incredible advisors. Um, this was uh, what we called a superblock prototype. The superblock being a module made of modules that could then make the final, the final project. Um, as you can see, it's it's get, it's gotten a little heavier than we can manage ourselves. Um, but our our test was extraordinarily successful, and so we're in the process of revising it towards a kind of proof, our next phase, which is a proof of concept hopefully in Brooklyn Bridge Park, uh, that we can put a 100-foot span and test the operations and logistics of the project. Over the course of the development of this project, though, the vision has expanded from just reclaiming a walk to reconnecting New Yorkers to their waterways as public space. Um, and, and my hope is that this bridge will be, uh, you know, really a catalyst for helping New Yorkers re-engage the waterways and will, in fact, be surrounded by a month of programming of hands-on activities where New Yorkers can learn how to bait a fish hook if they don't. They can learn about water quality testing. They can pilot an aqua robot or learn how to build a boat or learn how to pilot a boat or row a boat or paddle a boat. Um, because my vision in learning about the harbor and the waterways myself is a kind of interest in a future New York where life on the waterways is every bit as vibrant as it is in the city streets. However, it comes with some major, major obstacles. Um, as many of you probably know, obstacles like insurance, and permitting, and policy. And so that's why I'm interested and excited to have this conversation tonight, because I believe that there's something very interesting and specific and special about what happens when art and communities come together, especially on our waterways. And I think there's a kind of conversation to be had about how we can kind of facilitate that in new ways and how facilitating art and community can really add value to our waterways and waterfront. So thanks very much, Jean. Uh, hello, and thanks for having me. So, um, my name is Jean Barberis, and I'm part of a collective called Mario Iberum, which means the Free Seas. So we're a collective of artists, activists, engineers, uh, and boat builders. So our mission is to build boats with the public. Uh, that's the public. Um, mm. And take them out on the waterways of New York City uh, and beyond. Um, the way we work is we take some traditional forms of boats, uh, kayaks, uh, canoes, skiffs, um, so on and so forth, and um, we try to adapt those forms uh, to contemporary techniques that are, are very easy and approachable and that anyone basically uh, can have access to. Uh, for instance, this is a kayak design that we are building, uh, we build at the Guarana Studio space. Um, none of these people ever made a boat before, and in a couple of days they were able to make a, to make a seaworthy kayak using um, bamboo and canvas and zip ties and uh, plywood, and that's pretty much it. Um, so what we try to do is get people excited about building boats. Uh, sort of demystify um, the process of uh, boat building. I don't know if any of you are uh, <coughs> boat builders, um, but I know many people who spend years and years uh, building the perfect craft and they never end up taking it on the water. Our approach, <laughs> approach is kind of the opposite. We spend 
hours and hours uh, or a weekend building a boat and then you get to enjoy it uh, all summer long. Um, so uh, as part of the process, uh, typically we, we publish uh, broadsheets, uh, little um, uh, two-page sort of document that tells you about, um, that tells you how to build a boat and sort of also puts it in the context, uh, historical context, context of the local waterway. Um, so for instance, this is the same kayak you saw uh, completed um, with, the, uh, with the canvas uh, and the notes. Um, and so what do we do when we build those boats? Well, we take them out uh, around the waterways this is a part. This is, uh, for instance, an outing we did in collaboration with uh, the artist Mary Lawrence, uh, who's also a really great uh, artist working on the waterway, um, and uh, and the collective art, the arts collective Flux Factory. Um, so we spent a day taking people out. Um, this is a, a ship, ship graveyard in Staten Island. Um, really, really amazing place. Um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with it, but it's it's um, it's it's on the kills and all these old uh, tugboats and ferries and old ships are kind of rusting away. Um, so we spend a day ferrying about 30 people uh, on a fleet of our uh, plywood dories, and they got to explore um, this amazing site and be in contact direct contact with with the water and with the ships um, and for us um, our practice is really a way to get people interested in the waterway and um, get people to really interact with the water people who are not uh, from um, who are not, don't have like a, any sort of boating experience people who come from different communities around the water but don't really have access um, and Another big part, another big, big aspect of our work uh, is um, various forms of activism. Um, this is a project dating back uh, two summers ago uh, called Sea Change, um, during which we built a flotilla of boats out of paper. Um, this, is, this is one of them. We had six boats made out of paper, um, which we built with the public. Uh, once again, people who never, uh, never built boats sort of showed up. and helped us pack him a shade, these canoes, uh, and within a few days we had a fleet of, of seaworthy boats out of paper. And uh, we journeyed from Troy, New York, all the way down to New York City uh, in the course of two weeks, uh, paddling and rowing our paper boats and stopping along the way. We had about uh, a dozen of events, uh, talks, and uh, potluck dinners, um, and conversations uh, about extreme energy in, um, along the Hudson River, um, and that was kind of a lead up to the People's Climate March. Um, and the project project culminated in a um, uh, circumnavigation of Manhattan. So this is uh, you could basically see uh, the spot from the windows. Um, this is after we rounded the battery. Uh, probably one of the greatest days of my life. Um, we had um, amazing weather, uh, and we had just run the battery. And um, as a few minutes after this picture, picture was, take, was taken, people from the North Brooklyn Book Club um, and a marching band greeted us on the water. Mm -hmm. So they had two war canoes with a full-on marching band and escorted us up the East River. Uh, and this was a, an amazing moment of uh, of people coming together on the water on the water to sort of reclaim the waterway uh, and send a loud and joyous message to the world. Um, so that's that's what we do in a nutshell. I'm trying to see my slides through my camera function. I don't know if that's going to work. I think I, I think I can do it. Hi, my name is Kay Takeda. I'm the Director of Grants and Services at LMCC. Um, 
What I'm going to talk about is one particular project we've worked on over the past three years. Um, although uh, LMCC has been based in Lower Manhattan uh, for over 40 years, um, we are uh, we have a long history of presenting free public events uh, in Lower Manhattan. Um, we are the uh, organizing entity for the River to River Festival. Um, so we love the waterfront. We program the waterfront all the time. Um, but the program that I want to talk to you about, and of course we have a residency program on Governor's Island to support artists uh, in the creation and development of work uh, on that site. Um, but the program I want to talk to you about is Paths to Pier 42, which is part of our Arts East River Waterfront Initiative. And let me start using my slides. Um, and this was a project that um, we've worked with uh, with a number of really wonderful uh, community-based partners. The goal of the project was to develop temporary art and design installations uh, and public programming at Pier 42 while it awaits permanent development. Um, we were invited into the project by um, the Hester Street Collaborative, a public design group, uh, Two Bridges Neighborhood Council, a uh, low-income housing developer and uh, community advocate, Lower East Side Ecology Center, which I have a feeling many of you know, uh, good old Lower East Side, a neighbor neighborhood preservation organization, uh, and really strong support from State Senator Daniel Squadron uh, and from the city, uh, the city's park department. Um, before I talk to you about the project, though, I wanted to give you some background on the neighborhood uh, that we were, that we've been working in on the East River. Um, so this slide shows you the East River waterfront in the Lower East Side, along the and the two piers that we're talking about, where we focused our attention primarily Pier 42 um, and Pier 35, and together they represent sort of the last remaining undeveloped stretch of the East River uh, waterfront in Manhattan, um, and their development is um, greatly anticipated by the community. Uh, Pier 42, uh, the master plan, which I have here for you, um, and that the construction will begin in 27, 2017, as far as I know, uh, and Pier 35, uh, which is under construction, um, we understand may be complete in 2017. Um, the community is, has been following the progress of these sites for a long time, and there's been a lot of advocacy in the neighborhood around um, developing the waterfront in a way that is responsive to community needs. Um, to give you a little bit of background on the uh, neighborhood itself, Oh, no, that's Pier 35. I'm not looking at my slides. I apologize. So that's what that's the vision for Pier 35 when it's complete as an eco park. And so the neighborhood that is adjacent to these two piers, the Two Bridges neighborhood, um, is a really vibrant and diverse community. Um, there are about there's more than 40 percent of the residents are foreign born. Uh, many of them Asian from the Fujian province of uh, China. So a lot of people look at this uh, part of the neighborhood as sort of an extension of Chinatown with newer immigration. It's also a community in which the area median income is quite low. Uh, there are many uh, residents whose income, household income level is around $50,000 or less, and about an equal number of uh, at $25,000 or less. And 85% of the area's residents uh, receive subsidized housing. So it's not a wealthy neighborhood. It also represents um, the largest, it's part of the largest swath of public housing in New York City. Um, and so it's a very residential neighborhood. There are some local businesses. Uh, the neighborhood recently lost its um, supermarket. Um, and there aren't that many amenities. There are not any arts venues in this particular neighborhood either. Um, and so uh, in addition to this, when we were getting ready to start the project in 2012, uh, Hurricane uh, Sandy hit. And so this neighborhood was also very um, badly affected. Um, and so waterfront planning became an even more intense process, uh, looking at the waterfront not only as a wonderful amenity for the community, but an opportunity to think about uh, protection and resilience for the community. So the, the goal of Pier, Pats to Pier 42 was to um, activate a corner of Pier 42, uh, a vacant lot that you can see in the top of this slide, and to turn it into a temporary park that people could park, 
participate, where people in the community could participate in its creation, uh, and then come out and enjoy um, the site in the summer months. And to do that, we felt, you know, it was a really wonderful opportunity to bring artists and designers into that process. Um, you know, looking at two sites in the neighborhood that haven't been available to the public, um, it's a great opportunity for people to imagine together what the future can be and to model together what the future can be. And of course, artists have such a great role to play uh, in that process, and you've already heard from two, you'll hear from another. Um, and so we, we felt really honored to be part of this partnership that really believed in that um, ability of the arts to bring people out to the waterfront. Um, the bottom half of the slide is how the pier looked uh, on the opening day of the final projects in our first year. And Mary was one of the wonderful artists we worked with in that first year. Um, I'll talk to you a little bit more about some of those projects, but um, in terms of what we set out to do every year, we were trying to activate a temporary park every year with different projects. So each year what we did was uh, commissioned four to five artists who were interested in working uh, in a public space, interested in working with community members and community organizations to develop their projects, uh, and to collaborate with our community partners to develop public programming over the course of the public season. Um, and each year, uh, we would um, facilitate ways for uh, there to be input gathered from community members um, on artist plans and projects, and the ways that we went about that kind of evolved from year to year as we saw what was working and what wasn't working. Um, these images are from a public day we had on the, when the park just had mulch and was just an open space for people to meet the artists and find out about what they were doing and talk about the, what they wanted to see. Uh, we also, in our second year, began to work uh, with more artists who wanted to develop workshops in the neighborhood and work with people in the community in a closer way. Um, and so our focus started to shift a little bit more from um, primarily built projects uh, to transform a vacant lot into a, a vibrant, thriving park um, to also incorporate programming that would sort of, that would inform projects that would then land on the pier in the form of events or um, activities. Uh, we also invited community members to be part of building the park, either building projects that were on the site or doing planting and gardening, um, you know, community cleanup days, etc. so people could come out and be on the waterfront. And then we scheduled a series of public events every year. So as a partnership, we held three public events every year. Uh, and, we, and one of those every year coincided with City of Water Day, which was really wonderful. Uh, and our partners also brought their own programming to the pier. So that might be educational programming, fishing clinics, uh, and other kinds of activities uh, to keep the site active over the course of the, the warmer months. Um, Hello. Um, and so these are a few images of, I, I'd love to tell you about every project, but I can't. <laughs> um, so I've just pulled out a few uh, examples to um, let you know the kinds of artists that we work with and projects that um, came about. And so Mary is going to tell you much more about her own work, uh, but we're really honored to have her uh, with us in year one, uh, developing Triple Island, uh, a really wonderful um, uh, public work uh, and a kind of experiment in living and interdependent living systems. Um, there are people who were visitors to uh, this space. There was food growing, there was water collection system, uh, and the Lower East Side Ecology Center was a great partner in sort of bringing tour groups and students out to the site. Um, and I'll leave it to Mary to tell you more about her work. We worked with Chad Travieso, who transformed a fence uh, from a barrier, an ugly barrier to the site, into an interactive space for people to spend their time in seating, shade, uh, bike parking, a sandbox. And on the other side, I don't have an image, but it's a really great working with a graphic designer to create uh, an arrow, uh, a series of arrows that directed you to the entrance to the park. Um, you've seen a lot of images of blue barrels, mm -hmm. um, and uh, 
Combo Collab uh, worked with some of the barrels, I believe they came from Mary's installation, and augmented them uh, and created a drum reef on the site. And they worked on the site for two years, and so did Chat Travieso to expand uh, and adapt their installation. So in the first year, they built this installation, providing shade and seating, views of the water, playing with topography. And in the second year, they introduced water features um, at events where there were sort of bicycles that you know, were attached to a fountain, a human-powered fountain that would sprinkle water and create interactive water elements. Um, and then Takashi Murasaki is an artist who uh, wanted to work and meet people in the neighborhood as much as possible. So he arranged about 11 different workshops in the neighborhood with many community organizations, um, getting to know people in the neighborhood through hands-on art-making workshops, where people cast objects that were of personal importance to them, uh, and then taking those castings ultimately and putting them into a kind of installation on the site for one of our public events. Um, I think I skipped someone. No, I didn't. Okay. Uh, Stephanie Diamond uh, worked with uh, a group of middle school students to develop an audio tour, a walking tour that led from their neighborhood uh, to the pier. Uh, and that drew on 10 weeks of workshops focusing on public speaking, on taking New York City bus tours, taking the Tenement Museum tour, thinking about the tour as form, um, and sharing their own reflections and gathering um, material and conducting interviews. This was them um, doing a Lower East Side Jeopardy game on the waterfront on one of our public days. I failed miserably. <laughs> and Sonia Louise Davis, who spent time, also spent time in many, many workshop settings offering photography workshops uh, and taking portraits of community members that she printed in large format on newsprint as posters. Uh, so this project is the People's Poster Project. She met a lot of local residents, talked with them, uh, photographed them, and some of those posters were made available in, um, uh, in, in sets of a thousand in the neighborhood and then also posted on the waterfront. Um, if you want to know more about the Past Debris 42 project, which we've concluded our final public season, but we have a wonderful website that has images of um, all of the artists' work um, and more information about the partnership, um, and uh, happy to tell you more. Um, one thing I will mention is that we are also in a process now of looking at Pier 35 with other community partners around um, how to activate that space when it's complete, uh, working with choreographer Jennifer Monson, who's also really um, a kind of a trailblazer in developing interdisciplinary collaborative processes to bring people together around um, different sites to conduct research and um, open-ended research. And so we're interested to see where that goes. Stay tuned. to add to Paths to Pier 42. Nancy's sculpture was also embedded in that sculpture that I made. She donated one of her early bridge renditions to the project. So some of those barrels are also hers. That's right, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And Paths to Pier 42 really changed my idea of what art could be in public space because not only was it this interactive experience, but it also um, was, they almost, artworks there almost became a placeholder for something that could be a park, whereas that park space could have so easily been turned into something else. And the community and organizations like LMCC really got together to um, have art be really instrumental in this way that I think is very exciting. So, so I thought about art in different ways after that project and it still influences me. Um, so we'll just start off quickly with this slide, talking about um, my overall practice, much of it involves transforming military and industrial equipment into sculptural ecosystems. And I work with collaborators from a, a diverse background, from teachers to students to engineers and sometimes even lawyers. Um, I work to, towards forming autonomous public spaces, either temporary or permanent, and really trying to focus on water as a human right to reinforce that idea and to reimagine food as a potential public service and to think about what we can do together with common spaces. Um, my background is in photography, so I'm trained in this lens-based image making process where I use photography as a proposal to talk about a potential future, but also as a document or 
most recently. Uh, this is a document of a sculpture, I would say, and then most recently I used photography as part of a sculpture. And I just bring that up to talk about the importance of working in different ways and how you can sort of change a story um, afterwards, potentially, with while well using photography. Um, sculpture, to me, is something that changes all the time. It's usually based in performance, but I also see sculpture as a social space. And this is a project in Omaha, Nebraska, where we collectively built these structures that were then used um, by community groups and individuals sort of a, a stage or a platform for their own work. And then an experience, and Nancy talked about this briefly, this is called Wading Bridge, and this is in Des Moines. It was very temporary because the water moves so fast, it floods all the time, it's nitrate filled, and people were actually pretty nervous about it, even going into the water. So this was an experience that some people took up. Most people, I think, were even caut too cautious to go on to Wading Bridge while it existed, but it did bring that experience of the water to people who would have probably never stepped foot um, near it, potentially. Um, this is an early slide of Water Pod, and I wanted to talk about two projects very briefly. One is Water Pod, and the other is Wetland. And I can say just, um, and I guess to preface all this, my work sort of revolves around water because I grew up in a place where water was impossible to drink, where we had to buy bottled water and people were getting sick. So it's always been something that has been a constant in this work and something that I feel like I have a duty to sort of make active um, this idea of clean water and water accessibility as a human right. So I hope that that's something that we can talk about too. <coughs> so this is the first sketch of Water Pod, as I mentioned. It was conceived as a sculptural ecosystem and a habitat in 2006 for New York's waterways. It changed, obviously, multiple times. I um, wanted to sort of think about or create a more holistic way of living in a city where we depend on so many inputs and outputs uh, to survive in our daily life. I wanted to sort of think of this as a community center, but also as a private space. So it started from this place, and I quickly was told that I needed to talk to the U.S. Coast Guard, mm -hmm. who <laughs> I had to pretty much cold call, and they were nice. They didn't say no, and they definitely didn't say yes, but uh -huh. they said, yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they said, come down to, you know, show us your plans. We're interested in the idea of something without runoff. Um, they then put me in touch with the Department of Education, who suggested that I do workshops on this, because like you, Nancy, I was coming to this world with no prior experience. Um, so after doing workshops for about six months, I had a much more grounded idea, actually, from students <laughs> about what was realistic and probable. And we basically did these workshops based on the question, what would your water pod look like and how would it work? Um, so over the course of you know, working through all these ideas, we came up with something like this. And one thing that I want to say about working on the water is, especially making ecosystems, is it's a, it's a really profound space to be able to do something in a confined space that you would have, you would never really be able to see because ecosystems, for instance, are too large to be able to understand fully um, on land, but on the water you have this confined view, which can also be really beneficial. So this proposal was to have you know, farms on board that would feed people, myself and four intrepid friends, and collect rainwater and feed livestock and sort of run through this whole ecosystem where we were using our compost to regrow food potentially the following year, which did not happen. <laughs> so on a permit level, the water pod would need to be built on a barge. It would then be called an attraction vessel by the U.S. Coast Guard and would be allowed to dock at city-owned piers with no money exchanged. So a lot of the process, and this is a project that took three years to plan, was in order to see if we could do this mostly for barter. Um, we opened up an LLC to assume the responsibility, signed a 48-page contract with the city, had over 18 permits, including the most ridiculous, which was involved chickens being photographed, and finally <laughs> we were able to launch. We were able to actually, we, were, we built out at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, which I don't know if it would happen again for me. But um, it was a series of compromises. We used everything 
um, from the waste stream and actually some of the same students through some of our seedlings that we then were able to eat the following season. And finally launched in the summer of 2009. It went to the five boroughs for five and a half months. Um, it had a, this is a public space, that dome, and then there's a rainwater collection system. It's all solar powered. There are four gardens, four chickens, um, a little biospheric greenhouse uh, kitchen shower, and everything was gravity fed for water, and we reused it. And yeah, so this is just a little bit of the daily life. I think like Nancy mentioned, we were, we hosted almost 200,000 people over the course of the project, and some, somewhere during the project, the Parks Department gave us a sign to make us a temporary park, which, <laughs> which I think all of this stuff wouldn't have happened had it been um, sort of a quicker project that we tried to pull together at the last minute. It did take a long time. I'm going to skip through these and just go to wetland, which was pulled together quicker, and which was the process of receiving a grant um, from Fringe Arts in Philadelphia. So we were able to buy a boat hull um, with that part of that grant money. We used a gymnasium floor to build out this structure that's supposed to look like a sinking house on its side and uh, didn't have to deal with the same permit process, application process, because it was done by the granting organization. And I think that while it made the project much quicker, it also <coughs> had its own problems and setbacks. We weren't as attached to um, community organizations and groups, and as a result had to sort of make that work on our own. So six people helped build out wetland, and they all became co-owners in the space. So what that means for us is that whenever we want to use wetland, we get to, no matter what organization is sort of hosting it at the time. And we also wanted to have this ecosystem porous, so it was not, we needed to. It wasn't like the water pod where we would have everything that we needed in one space. Um, here we knew that we would need to leave to come and go to get the supplies that we would need. It functioned as an artist's residency, so people did not want to stay on wetland all the time either. But we were able to have this process of hosting dinners when wetland was growing enough food and when it wasn't um, getting extra supplies from a place like Greens Grow. Um, <coughs> And at the end of the project, or where it is right now, is the University of Pennsylvania is using wetland for their new environmental humanities program. And I think that this has been a kind of a slow growth process. The wonderful thing about it is that we do own it, so it can continue to live on. Um, the harder thing was, I think, being engaged in the beginning of the project. So that's <coughs> a growing experience. So thank you. I'll stop there. so many notes I don't even know where to start. But I want to start actually, I think Roland put it best, why and how. Um, and I'd love to talk a little bit about why. Um, and specifically, what, what is it about doing the waterfront or the waterways as art? Um, what is it that, that, that is kind of special or different about doing the waterways and waterfront as art to you? Um, because we could be calling these practices something else, right? We could be framing these works in other ways, and we are choosing to call them art. Yeah. Any? Why? It's no. a big question. Okay. Well, can you break it down? Break it down to something digestible. I mean, I think that maybe one reason is because it is a commons, and the more people involved in that commons, the potentially safer it is, and, and better functioning it is. But that could be just one why. Yeah. And Sean, how about you? Um, for me, being being in New York or living in New York City, the first time I stepped on the boat and saw the, the city from the water, I felt like I rediscovered it entirely. And, yeah. uh, and it was a very empowering experience, and I just kept wanting more and more. Uh, so um, building, building my own boat and, and taking the public on that felt like a really empowering experience. And that's, uh, that, that's, that's, that's the main reason. And also, there's so much water in New York City, it's, I mean, there's 700, so 700 miles of coastline, 
uh, and it's one of the rare spaces where you just you know, I feel completely free. Like every public space in New York feels like very policed. I feel like it's hard to, to, to do anything uh, to find that sense of freedom. But on the water, it's a completely different experience. It is, isn't it? I mean, I, for me, this is the hard part about being a facilitator and a presenter, but for me, um, working as an artist in this space kind of opens up some really interesting space um, that I don't think I would find as um, some other kind of organization, whether that be an educational organization or some other kind of, I don't know, design organization. There's something about art to me that creates a kind of in-between space, right? It's, you know, especially working on the water, which is forever an in-between space, right? It's completely ephemeral. I think as, as artists, we kind of, some doors open to us where they might not, not open to other people because no one actually knows what to expect. And maybe that's really the question, is about kind of expectations um, and how, you know, how you have kind of levied expectations by permitting um, organizations or by the community that you're working with to kind of get, get somewhere else, right? Get somewhere else than maybe where the person that you're working with or the person across from the table kind of thought they might be starting out. So there's more chance. <laughs> yeah. More chance for anything, I guess. What's exciting is that there's just a level of chance that you're not really sure what to expect, right? So it's potentially more dangerous, but <clears throat> always more exciting. Yeah. And are you going to yeah, ask a question? I, I want to say, well, well, people are drawn to the water. Um, and so it's a, it's a kind of a, you know, waterfronts can be really amazing places. So many things happen in waterfronts, obviously, but um, you know, a lot of people use the waterfront as a place of reflection, even if they can't touch the water, or be in the water. Um, so I think it's it's a kind of really wonderful setting um, for artistic work, um, just because there's there's a kind of psychological openness that perhaps um, we bring to to the water that we might not to a kind of built out public space. Um, and in terms of sort of the why around art and, and, and some of the spaces that we've been working in, and um, you know, there's there's a level of, well, I'll speak very specifically for this project because I feel like the why of this project was really important to us, um, is that you know people really wanted to be part of the thinking about their waterfront. They really wanted that, um, but they were spending a lot of time in community board meetings, um, and. Um, civic processes that are essential and very important, and, but there are more and more of them, particularly after Superstorm Sandy, um, and activating a site together and kind of thinking together and making something together and having an experience with the waterfront and what it is and what it could be, um, I think it, it's just a, it's a different dynamic. It, it allows people to come and bring a different part of themselves um, to to relationships they already have. I mean, there are, there are people who would um, really not like each other in a community <laughs> board meeting, and they'd be like bringing each other water on, on the waterfront um, at an event. Um, and I think, you know, there are also, there are only so many people who go to these kinds of civic meetings. Um, so while I might bring my family to the waterfront because I want to find something for, that my kids would enjoy on a weekend, um, and I might not go to a community board meeting. You know, we felt there's an opportunity both for enjoyment, kind of enhancing quality of life, discovering something new, um, and then possibly becoming more involved in something um, that you might not be involved in through the normal channels. Um, and so, not to go on too long, but there, one of the, you know, there's some unexpected the outcomes we even maybe hoped for, but not. Um, didn't kind of say this is this is what the project is for, but there are there were some really wonderful developments in relationships and um, uh, resident association leaders who are our advisors on this project who later on joined community board committees and and joined the board of the new South Street East River Community Development Corporation, um, and so. Um, do we say it's because of the art project? Not necessarily, but um, I think that it's it's really wonderful to think about the fact that 
you know, art is part of everyone's lives, and it's also part of how we think about the future of, of where we live. Um, and so that opportunity to be um, part of that conversation and, and, and to shift that dynamic up a little bit has been really rewarding. Uh, sure. Well, uh, a question. Um, two of you mentioned bridges. Uh, I think art is possibly a, a bridge, uh, you know, for our curiosity to explore mm -hmm. the fascination and fear that we have of water. And so your art draws us to the water to explore that, uh, you know, uh, fascination and fear. I think that's right. And I think I was listening to everyone speak, and, and there's, an, there's kind of a repetition of the word of rights, right? Right to the water, kind of a right to your voice and self-determination, and a right to public space. And I think that is really well put, that, you know, in my mind, art is a kind of a bridge between people who don't maybe see themselves as political, <clears throat> right? But who care about self-expression, who care about making things together, who care about what their idea of art is, um, and, and, sorry, my brain just went shroom. Um, but who care about these things? And because the invitation is through art, there is, there is then an opportunity to become somewhat politicized, somewhat um, empowered. I mean, you both, everyone here used the word kind of empowerment in one way or another. Um, and that there's something really crucial I think about all all of the projects that we're talking about here because it's really about knowledge and experience and it's really about inviting people in um, to this massive thing right that's right outside our doors but it's not clear how to literally how to get get in right and I think we all have a lot of really interesting experiences of what getting in has meant, or what helping people get in, whether that be to a planning process, whether that means getting into a boat, or getting getting into the idea of a kind of ecosystem or ecology, like art is that kind of invitation to get in, but it it seems to require so much, and I, I we also all talked about um, interdisciplinary collaboration and partnership, and I wonder if you, you guys can just talk about a little bit more about that, about how you find your partners, how you or how you seek them out, um, and how you begin to work together, and what what you've learned in working in these interdisciplinary partnerships. Because I think it's interesting to have four people at the table, all of whom are saying teachers, engineers, designers, architects, you know artists, boat builders, like all of these people coming together, and I think that's very, that's something very particular about the waterfront and the waterways. I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at you, Barry, only because you have had so many different kinds of projects that require like massive partnerships. Well, I guess I, it's true that I think to be on the water you need to collaborate, right? It's almost impossible to do anything alone on the water. Even be in a boat by yourself, it's a little bit daunting. You so need a buddy. You need a buddy, at least a buddy. <laughs> <laughs> so we all just have lots of buddies. <laughs> um, I do think it's about co-learning too, so it's <clears throat> what we're doing is learning so much from mm. these trades that um, we're able to share. So. That's what's been, I think, most exciting about it to me, is to be able to learn from a water engineer how mm -hmm. to potentially make a constructed wetland on my own, although I would not call myself an expert in any of that. I think that I could definitely do a further test. So I think building upon that knowledge and then um, someone from the other side of Brooklyn coming onto this structure that has a floating wetland and telling me how it should be done is something that um, has been really important about all of these projects is that they can progress as projects or they can really grow or become something else because of different inputs. Yeah, I, I certainly, so co-learning is a great word. Co-learning absolutely defines the process I've, I've gone through with Citizen Bridge. It's like co-learning and collaboration all the way because my God, Lord help me if I, 
if I set out to do any of those things by myself. Um, and I think you're right. There is something that is like inherently cooperative and collaborative about the waterways. Um, but I was wondering, John, if you could talk to us about how did, how did you guys learn how to build those boats? Where did that come from? Paper boats. Can you talk to us about paper boats some more? Sure. Uh, for about 40 years, um, they were actually uh, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of paper boats produced. Um, uh, and the method is basically papier mache. Um, uh, but you say that so well. Oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, papier mache um, uh, onto the existing form of a boat. So it's actually for us probably the easiest way to build a boat because we've we've done it with um, high school students with with kids that are six years old. Did you guys just teach yourselves? Uh, pretty much, yeah. Um, we, we, we found out about this method of fabrication through a, a, a book called The uh, Voyage of the Paper Canoe by Nathaniel Bishop, which was a 19th century explorer who traveled from Troy down to New Orleans on a paper canoe. Uh, and, uh, and sort of from the book and from whatever documents we can find, sort of we um, created the process, um, which is essentially you lay strips of, strips of paper on the on the form of, of an exist, existing boat, uh, and then waterproofing it, uh, and then um, adding the the woodwork, so the gunnels and the ports and the seats. Um, so it's a very easy way to make a seaworthy vessel. Um, it does not sound easy at all. <laughs> so you guys, just how many of you are? How many are in the collaborative? Um, so it varies between uh, four or five people, and sometimes up to eight, depending on the projects. And how do you guys how do you guys work together? Does one of you read the book, and then kind of <laughs> tell everybody? I mean, because you have to. There's some. There, you must be kind of learning from each other as you go. Y yeah, absolutely. And we um, we have people with very different sort of skill sets. There's a there are two engineers, ah. um, Dylan Gautier, who. Uh, is more from an um, academic background, more of a theorist. He uh, reads the book, doesn't he? Yeah, he reads the book. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I myself, who is, has more of a carpenter background, um, I remember one time I was designing, pr making a prototype with Stefan von Mullen, uh, who's an engineer, and, and myself, and he was designing the boat on CAD, on the computer, and I was at a pile of cardboard and scissors, and basically was cutting the shapes Wow. And we sort of met somewhere in between and came up with a seaworthy uh, boat. Uh, so. I feel like that is the metaphor. CAD meets cardboard. Yeah. <laughs> and somehow it floats. Some, somehow it floats, yeah. Uh, and well, for, for us, it's, we, have to both, to, we have to be able to make it, but also we, we want it to make it uh, easy enough for anybody to make it. So we really take classic shapes and compromise the integrity of the boat a lot so it, we can make it fast and cheap and easy. <clears throat> you still make it sound so much easier than I believe that it is. Mm -hmm. uh, will you be running any more workshops, boat building workshops this summer? Do you have any plans? Um, yes. We, I believe we have, um, I should know this, but I don't, but I'm sure it's on our website, uh, thefreeseas.org. <laughs> Um, yeah, we have we have uh, a workshop coming up in April, but I, I don't have the details. That's so no, okay. I'm just curious because I I want to learn. Um, and can I have a question for you? So, it seems like Paths to Pier Forty Two is extraordinarily successful and kind of is this big partnership of organizations, you know, kind of bringing bringing all of their various communities together and Pier Forty Two. The work there is done for the time being. For the time being. So if, if, if there was another waterfront community in the city, how, how, would this, how would you imagine carrying this work forward? Like what if you, what are your kind of takeaways? I, there, are, there are so many waterfront communities in the city. Well, I think one of the things that's, that's a very good question because, you know, f at least for LMCC's part, we entered this partnership because we were invited. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and, and the partnership, and part of the reason we moved forward is because the partnership was so extraordinary. 
Um, it was really a combination of organizations that had complementary kind of roles and knowledge, um, and a really long histories of you know relation, local relationships, advocacy, um, and community service. And we felt that really complemented our history as a as a public art presenter and a supporter um, of artists and their practices. So we felt that we were all really aligned because none of us were going anywhere. Um, and, and that there are particular kind of concerns within the neighborhood that um, that knowledge and history was really important um, to bring to any sort of programming and thinking that we did on the project. So in terms of looking for, you know, if we were to, you know, go out seeking to replicate the project, which isn't exactly, I know right. that's not what you're saying, but it's, you know, what we looked, you know, what we saw and what thought was, was a really great opportunity was that that partnership felt very solid. Um, and, and I think when you said the project seemed extraordinarily successful, I think I winced a little bit, um, only because a project like that is always a work in progress, mm. and you can get lost in the weeds a little sometimes. And mm. um, it, it's helpful to sort of step back and say, oh, wow, look at what we really did, you know? Mm -hmm. um, because looking at the how of that project, the, those organizations, our organizations met once a week for three years. You know, it, and that's not wow. what, that is not what we expected to do. <laughs> so we know each other really well. It's it's been time uh, well spent, but um, that was the level of commitment I think that people really brought to the to the partnership, and it's something that's that um, we would certainly, and it's something that we look for. We work in partnerships all the time. So um, some of you may know us um, from River to River for many years, in which, and that's a particular kind of partnership, a very different kind of partnership. Um, but again, we, we always sort of look for the right partners in the right circumstance. And I think for, for the neighborhood and for the kind of projects we were talking about, it was a good partnership. Um, and, and for our part, we, would, we were able to do like sort of in the how piece beyond meeting every week. Um, you know, we felt our role was very clear in being able to facilitate kind of um, bringing artists into the project. Um, also in a sort of fundraising plan to bring arts funding in to pay the artists and support the costs um, to do the projects on site um, and to have and to plan complementary kind of funding streams with our partners around um, um, compensation for um, our community partners and actually like on site um, uh, design and construction to make the site a park. Um, in addition, you know, more cohesive. Um, so um, there are a lot of complementary, being clear about complementary roles, and I also think um, equitable fundraising is really uh, important. Those are things that we would look for in any kind of partnership project on a waterfront or anywhere. Why <laughs> limit <laughs> just the water? Anyway. Yeah, you touched on something. So weekly meetings for three years. Yeah. So yeah. let's talk about time. That Let's talk about time. Challenge. That's a challenge. Let's talk about time and the role that it plays in your work. And John, you've been doing Mario Labarum for how many years? Uh, since 2010. Since so six six years. Yeah, the, the collective has been around for longer. I think it was founded in 2008, but I'm not. Was that make, was that when it was on the Gowanus? Uh, yeah, it was still based on the Gowanus. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you have some time in your work and. You have three years of weekly meetings, okay. and Mary, you have how many? How many? Uh, I guess since the planning phase, it's ten years. It's a decade. Wow. Yeah. For what? For, for starting to work on the water. So for starting the water. Work on, yeah. Ten years. We started planning in 2006, and it happened in 2009. Wow. And what? What do you like? What? So what is my question? My question is like. What, how, that's really different from the way a lot of other art gets made, right? Like there's no, there's no, it's being in a studio by yourself, there's this like really, really kind of, you know, part of a whole new genre of art making, but a really different model of art making, right? Especially in, in our daily lives, right? Where we're, you know, trying to send out 10,000 tweets a day, right? There's a kind of like, like a necessary act of completion. And none of these projects, ever really feel completed, right? Or they, they, you know, we spend all this time doing these things and we just kind of keep doing them in different ways. So can you, I don't know if you guys can talk about like 
how how time influences your projects or your work on the water? Maybe everything is a prototype, and then the next one is you can change it to, you know, what didn't work about one, you can change in the next one. Or I guess I think about it like that, but I would just to ask you for a second, when that. Citizen Bridge happens, yeah. will that feel complete, or will it <laughs> then be your goal to make a permanent bridge? Or, I don't know. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so my long-term view, my long-term goal for Citizen Bridge is actually one that that begins to th that that's based on uh, the summer streets program and i'm interested that in the idea or in a, in a future where citizen bridge could come back every summer and there is a kind of um, not an either or idea about the waterways but a yes and right so maybe there is a day where buttermilk channel or other waterways could be closed to commercial traffic so that so that new yorkers can kind of feel a little safer to get out on the water in new ways um, with respect to time, um, I, f I found that when I started this project with an LMCC residency on Governor's Island, I found it was six months. I have six months to do this project. I have to, to file my permit. I have 180 days, and here I go. Um, because heretofore, that had, been my, that had been my experience with life in general, right? It's a kind of, it's a kind of quantifiable amount of time. And it's really not time that doesn't last for more than a year at a time. And very quickly I realized that I would be lucky if I could get this project done within four or six years, and I'm four years into it. Um, but there's a real beauty in this kind of time, the water time. Um, the water time is like a kind of time I know Dylan has spoken to me when you're out on the boat and you kind of just forget about the hours a little bit. But there's also a kind of the seasonal time of the waterways. You can only get so much work done. You can only learn so much within the building season of the summer, the building and testing season as I live it in the summer. The way that I approach a lot of things in my life is that it, it's going to take the time that it takes. And what that approach to making this particular art project has done is build incredible relationships. And I think there's something about all of these things that go together. Um, I'm so sad that John Doswell isn't with us anymore because uh, he really, he was such a special, special person, both to me and, and to many people in this room. And, and I really felt like he was the kind of godfather of the, of the waterways here. And, you know, he had such an like, easygoing attitude. He's like, well, we're all just here together. Isn't that great? And, I think that's true. I think there is something about the water that brings people together. And Citizen Bridge is really a thousand tiny bridges about bringing people together and getting to know people over the course of all of these years. And you know, seeing seeing my seeing seeing colleagues on the project get married. You know, you know, watching people change like watch lives change over the course of this project. And I think it's. You know, there's something incredibly meaningful and rewarding about that that I never would have anticipated. That was never a kind of um, goal of this project, was to actually begin to grow old with people on the waterfront um, as I kind of began to un unpack it. And just to follow up, the tides have been really influential, I think, because there's certain times you can and can't do things. So you're not looking at the watch, you're really looking at nature. And that's been a different approach, too. Oh my god, totally. Um, I want to switch to the, I don't know, how much time do we have? Ten minutes? OK. I, I want to switch and start talking. Talk, he was talking a little bit about the how. Um, I have a lot of words. And I don't know if you want to just kind of talk about some of these words. I have temp temporary came up a lot. Um, compromise came up. Um, per, like rules, rules came up, sort of. Um, and there's also this idea of prototyping that I that kind of keeps coming back to me. And and lastly, um, the idea about well, time again. The idea it's the tension between. The idea of like creating a temporary space or something and long-term engagements, mm -hmm. right? 
so multiple year things versus uh -huh. that that may be temporary. But there's I don't know. There's these these are the things that I'm these are the things I'm thinking about, and I don't know if anyone wants to speak to any of these words. Um, Mir okay. Maybe. Yeah. Well, I would just say prototyping. I think it's is an interesting concept. The idea of just iteration and modeling, and I think um, that that can um, be relevant to a kind of annual project as much as an evolving, um, uh, open-ended work um, that you're you're trying something out, you're refining it, you're trying it again. Um, and, and by trying things out with the number of people involved, then you're modeling something. You're modeling the future, um, particularly you know, in a site like Pure 42. Um, we, did, we were conscious of that. We're like, oh, we're modeling what can and will happen on this waterfront when it's permanently developed. And, and also allowing folks like Matthews Nielsen landscape designers to actually come out to the site and see what people were doing and trying out. So there, I think there is that there's both the relationships and then there's there's this potential for relationships and, and um, new thinking to inform what comes next. That's anyway the citing of this project. Yeah. Sean, Mary. Uh, well, you were bringing up um, rules and regulations um, and, and and time. We found that the smaller the boat, the less rules uh, and regulation you have to face. So uh, I know, Mary, that you tend to go the opposite way, really, <laughs> really big, and <laughs> a lot of permitting. But if your boat is under 16 feet and has no motor, you can basically do anything. Uh, so it's, it's less about the rules and more about the responsibility you have towards the public to make, to make sure everyone is safe and provided with a life jacket and proper equipment and guidance. Yeah, that's our approach. Interesting. Mary, were you going to say something? Yeah, no, I guess just on the rules, I think that it's like to try to figure out a roadmap for doing more things has been always really exciting to me. And I think that hopefully um, once you have a sense of what kind of permits are needed for a particular place, then more and more projects can happen. And I think that what we came across with WaterPod was that um, so many agencies like really didn't know if we would need permits to be in particular at a public dock, like would we need Department of Buildings permits, would we need mm -hmm. fire? Um, all of these things that you might not associate with doing something on the water. And to try to, at the end of that project, reassess and figure out what actually was needed and what was a projection um, with all the agencies that were consider considering this was um, helpful, I think, in the next projects that they thought that they should be involved in or that someone asked them to be involved in, um, which I think was the Natalie project that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess that's been really interesting to figure out what the roadmaps are and they are always changing because mm -hmm. the waterways are always changing and as years go by and people come in and out of jobs that then the standards seem to change. Um, so that's really confusing and um, also <laughs> can be, I guess, gratifying to an extent if you, you know, try to see the bright side. Um, and I guess on compromise, maybe that, that that's something that I also really enjoy and I'm glad that there's a place for it within art so I really enjoy figuring out what the boundaries are and then trying to compromise and I've learned so much from other artists I've collaborated on projects with about aesthetics but also from agencies uh, about what can and can't happen and I think that that's um, something that I'm glad there's a home uh, within within arts for something like, with, like compromise and and I think in relationship to rules and compromise, trust is like mm. the most important thing. Because the rules, the interpretation of the rules depends on trust, mm. I think. Um, and um, anyway, I feel we, we had a really fortunate, we were really fortunate to have a great relationship with the Parks Department. They, mm. they put a lot of trust and faith in us. And um, I think that really helped us to be able to um, Realize projects in a way with with um, um, without a lot of uncertainty, um, and they were willing to sort of put up with the level of uncertainty from us as well. Right, and I think that's that's such a great point to bring up. Right, it goes back to relationships, this idea of trust. But I think this is a particularly hard space. Um, 
for artists, not because we're not trustworthy, but I think mm -hmm. sometimes artists get it, have a kind of a reputation <laughs> in the world, right, as, be, as being, you know, uh, kind of out, outside, outside of the rules, quite literally. And, and the water is a place that it's rel relatively, unless you have a boat less than 16 feet. Mm -hmm. Hold on one sec. Uh, it's, really, it's really hard to actually um, work in the space without wading right into all of the rules. Um, it's been, and it's, yeah, I mean, un unpacking the regulatory um, space of the waterways has been absolutely fascinating and kind of maddening mm. for me because I'm not working with a, I'm not working with a vessel, I'm not working with navigation, I'm kind of, this project is flying in the face of a lot of policies and a lot of regulations. Um, and it's a project that no one knows what to do with sometimes, right? So talk about having to build, to do a lot of work to build relationships, which thankfully is something I love to do. The, I've only gotten as far as I have because I've, I've done all my homework and I've like shown, shown up ready to kind of have a, a conversation about the 42 page uh, Coast Guard bridge manual application, uh, bridge, bridge application manual, and I've highlighted point for point where I need clarification, right? Which is something that's not expected of an artist to show up to a meeting with the head of the bridge division of the Coast Guard, but yet there I came. And I think there is, there is a kind of power that comes with unpacking the roadmap. The tough part is, right, is the roadmap's always changing, and the roadmap doesn't, isn't written for a lot of a lot of the projects that we've we're trying to do and other artists are trying to do, and so for me, I'm I'm really interested in the possibility of having a conversation around you know not if not a policy policy expansion, policy exemptions for artists trying to do uh, trying to bring kind of unusual and let's say gray area ideas into the waterways, right? Um, because right now I'm staring down an EIS, um, which, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm hoping for a categorical exemption. Um, but it's things like that that I think, they're really fascinating, but at the end of the day they can, they can make or break a project. And that's just because the policy never thought something, like, something this would, like this would ever exist. And I think that's the magic of art. But that's the, that's the, that's I think a space that we need to address now. If we want to move ahead as a city, you know, with a future of climate change coming, coming at us full throttle. I mean, the water is going to be a ongoing theme, an ongoing, you know, kind of an ongoing conversation. And more, like, there's going to be, I think, more and more people interested in, in kind of addressing that in a lot of different ways. But right now, the policies and the regulations are really about kind of permanent construction, navigable craft, and, and not much else. Um, but having said that, I can't wait to go to the, uh, the SBS, the Small Business <laughs> Services, services <laughs> to talk to them about my structure. Um, so anyways, <laughs> there's a question. Yeah, well, I would say policy exemptions for more than artists can be everybody so we can broaden the idea. Exactly, sorry. I didn't mean just for artists, but policy exemptions for, let's, let's, let's look, temporary projects, prototype projects. I guess my question is, what lessons from the work you've done and as artists or those who support artists do you have for others who communicate about these issues so that it's more than just, here's what we're about to lose, here's what's at risk, it's more, here, here's how, as a journalist or others, policymaker, I can focus uh, on what could be mm -hmm. in a positive sense. Are there lessons? Maybe not. No, 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 no. Well, I'm thinking. I'm yeah, thinking about it. Question. I'm thinking about it. I, you know, because I haven't realized the project to its fullest extent yet. I, it's hard to speak from that future. But what I can say, from building all these prototypes, right, is that they. Um, I think it's important to get people in the water. I think it's really important to involve people from all of these spaces, right, from the community to people in policy to bring them actually into the water with, with artists and, and, 
and the and the visions and the projects. I mean, I can't, I loved. I didn't know this about Paths to Pier Forty Two that you had a day where the community could come and meet the artist before the art was made. Mm -hmm. That's incredibly powerful to me um, because it you know it makes the community complicit in the process. Complicit is probably the wrong word. <laughs> no, but it, it it makes them it brings them it brings them it welcomes it wel welcomes them into the process in a way I'm I'm not I've never gotten to participate in myself. Um, but you know that there's I went to a, another conference earlier in the winter where they were talking about platforms, right? Which is really in a way what we're kind of talking about. Art is a platform to engage people with the water. And they said, you know, for a platform to be really um, successful, you have to you have to start with who you want to end with, mm -hmm. right? And so I think if the way to talk to people about these these kinds of things is to kind of really let them embody it, um, I would have known nothing about the waterways if I hadn't literally started embodying it through this project, um, and I wouldn't. I wouldn't be so committed to having every New Yorker learn how to swim uh, if I hadn't gotten into the water in Red Hook and been fine and thought, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not sick, I'm not dying. It was really spectacular, in fact. And I, and I feel like in terms of risk, if, if you want to change the climate of risk in the city, we were talking about this a little, a little earlier, everyone needs to learn how to if, if everyone in the city knows how to swim, the risk landscape looks a lot different. Uh, right? Yeah. I see a lot of heads. Yeah, if, if, if everyone learns how to swim and everyone learns how to navigate a boat, yes. risk, yes. the risk on the waterways changes immensely. Um, I think I wanted to just add sort of the question of what, like looking at risk and what we can uh, kind of look forward to is um, there are two, well, I should be quick because I think we need to move on to another thing, but um, one of the artists we worked with, Tat Fu Tan, was very interested in doing workshops around because he had been very interested in the idea of personal resilience um, and how to sort of engage people around what they could do in their individual lives given um, everything that happened that's everything that happened after Superstorm Sandy and, and you know, to kind of think about, oh, like, well, I'm, I can, I have agency, I can do something. Um, and the, it always kind of grows out of his own ideas. And so he, um, he charmed the pants off of us at a meeting in which he pulled out a personal survival kit and lit a fire at the conference room table in front of us. And, you know, it was really just talking about, you know, what would you need to have in your survival kit? People can learn these things, we can we do these workshops. So he did, he, he um, had survival kit uh, stations on the waterfront, on the pier, in the summer months, and people could come in and, and build their own survival kit. Um, he also um, had other ideas around, like, make a bug out bag, work with teenagers to make their own, like, to go backpack with what you need in there. Um, and so, so, so to kind of be prepared, but to bring imagination to it, um, and to come together around that work. Um, there's another, um, and he's actually an artist, Paul Guerin, who's been driving this, um, um, portable Wi-Fi project called Wi-Fi New York. Um, has been collaborating with Two Bridges Neighborhood Council and other organizations in Lower Manhattan, um, in the Lower East Side, looking at ways to provide Wi-Fi access if there's another uh, oh. disaster. Um, and he's been taking that to all kinds of public spaces, and, and he brought the prototype out to the waterfront as well. So I think that, that was also, there were also great opportunities to bring like-minded organizations and individuals with ideas. Um, that were really meaningful um, out into this public space. Yeah, so I know we have to move on, but I hope maybe afterwards we might be able to talk really quickly about this kind of interesting feedback loop between res like resilience and quality of life and the idea of the amenity of the water in front of the waterways is that space where those two things come together. Mm -hmm. So, we're time for the night. what? One more time for the night. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. You, we can move on. No, 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 we're time for the it's eight o'clock. Oh, it's eight o'clock already. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. There was supposed to be some technology that happened. Um, are you sure you're okay? Yeah. Okay. I was very curious about that technology. I know. We're really. Can we do the technology, please? <laughs> oh, we have to stop. <laughs> Turn it. Well, I'll just say thanks to everyone um, for a great conversation, and thanks to everyone for who asked questions. And if you have more questions, you can come find us afterwards in OPS. Look for a Kickstarter campaign for Citizen Bridge soon. <laughs> uh, on behalf of the Alliance, I want to say
to say thank you to uh, all of you who came out tonight, as well as all the participants. Uh, we hope you join us uh, next week for a conversation about uh, innovative data management, visualization in waterfront spaces, and uh, for the four subsequent weeks after that, right back here. And we hope to see you at our conference on May 12th. Thanks. Thank you so much. Awesome.